Well, good morning, everyone, and so excited for this uh, call today. Um, you know, coronavirus has forced us to rethink how we communicate, and uh, we all love being out there in person in our communities, uh, but uh, we can't do that as much right now because uh, it's not safe. So uh, this is a chance for us uh, to talk virtually about uh, important issues, uh, such as medically tailored meals, health equity, and, and food insecurity, all issues that uh, I care very deeply about, and I know my colleague, Ayanna Presley, uh, feels the same way. Uh, I'm excited to be chatting today with three people who have done so much on these issues. Uh, the coronavirus is holding a mirror up to our country. It's allowing us to see the inequities and injustices that existed long before this pandemic started. Uh, just a quick example. Um, I've been working on the issue of food insecurity for, for many years. Um, many of the chronic diseases that lead to worst coronavirus outcomes are either caused by or exacerbated by poor nutrition. Uh, in many communities, um, and in, particularly in some communities of color, um, it's not possible uh, for people to find affordable, uh, healthy food. Uh, we have things called food deserts and uh, among other things, among other challenges. Um, so, this is, so this is a nutrition issue, it's, it's a healthcare issue, and it's also a racial justice issue. Uh, it's also an issue where we can forge consensus and make change. I have a bill to create a pilot program which would allow doctors to prescribe something called medically tailored meals to Medicare patients uh, with chronic conditions to help combat these problems and break the cycle of poor nutrition and chronic disease that has impacted so many communities. I'm a big believer that food is medicine. Uh, but before we begin uh, this conversation, let me introduce everyone quickly so we can get right into the, into the conversation. First, Ayanna Presley represents the seventh uh, district of Massachusetts, elected in 2018. She and her team have been amazing partners on issues of food insecurity, fighting to maintain funding for SNAP, uh, which is a supplemental nutrition assistance program. I'm proud to serve alongside her and so grateful for her leadership, not just in our delegation, uh, but in our caucus uh, and throughout the Congress. David Waters, a CEO of Community Servings, an amazing advocate for integrating medically tailored meals in our healthcare system. And I'll let him explain more about his organization in a minute. Manny Lopez, the president and CEO of East Boston Neighborhood Health Center, devoted his career to increasing healthcare access for vulnerable and underserved populations and improving outcomes for communities that are disproportionately burdened by negative social determinants of health. And uh, I, am in awe and admire the work of all three of our, our guests here today. But let me get right into our conversation. I'll begin with, with my friend, David Waters. David, can you briefly explain for people who don't know what are medically tailored meals and what does your organization, Community Servings, do to help provide medically tailored meals? Absolutely, and thank you all for, for helping us with this issue because it just it's so heartening to see leaders of, uh, that I respect so much involved in this fight. Um, so a medically tailored meal, Jim, uh, is defined as a meal that's delivered to an individual living with a severe illness through a referral from a medical professional or healthcare plan. Meal plans are tailored to the medical needs of the recipient by a registered dietitian, uh, nutritionist, an RDN, and are designed to improve the health outcomes, lower cost of care, and increase patient satisfaction. MTMs, as we call them, or medically tailored meals, grew out of the HIV epidemic in the early 90s and the federal Ryan White program. Um, it was the first time where food for the sick was something that America was endorsing. Uh, over the past 30 years, we've seen that benefit for many diverse groups, starting with HIV, but then obviously diabetes and kidney failure and cancer, cardiac disease, et cetera. Here at Community Servings in Boston, we feed people across Massachusetts. Um, we were feeding, uh, before the pandemic, we were feeding about 1,000 people a day, and that's grown 50% in only three months. Uh, some of those folks are living with COVID, and many are very at risk. They're immune compromised, they're isolated, they're sick, they're very scared. Uh, and what we can offer them is our meals, much like a prescription, that are tailored uh, for multiple comorbidities or multiple illnesses um, within the same meal. So just as your doctor or your pharmacist prescribes medications, 
we use food in the same way. It's all scratch made beautiful food uh, using local produce from Massachusetts farms uh, and glean from the, the food waste systems, but then it's tailored to their particular medical needs. And with that, we see, um, as we'll get into, uh, significant cost savings and improvement in health outcomes. No, and I've been on some of the visits with you uh, to deliver those meals, and it's really been inspiring. And, you know, one of the things I've always um, been puzzled by is that if we all believe that food is medicine, why is it that when you go to the doctors that they only can prescribe pills for you, but they can't prescribe that nu nutritious food? Uh, which oftentimes uh, can make it unnecessary for you to take the pills and, you know, obviously is much uh, better for you. Um, Ayana, you know, we have research that a poor diet contributes to COVID-19 risk, especially for pe people with underlying health conditions. We also know that our food system is shaped by deeply rooted racial injustice in our country, meaning many individuals in underserved communities cannot access healthy food. And so they're at higher risk for COVID-19 complications. Can you talk about how COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted certain communities and how medically tailored meals could help alleviate uh, that, that uh, impact? Sure, first, Jim, um, you know, it's hard for me to speak with brevity about the regard with which I hold you, my oh. colleague and brother in this Thank work, you. but you are a, um, a national leader on the issue of food insecurity and it's been, um, just an honor to serve alongside you and to follow your lead and to partner with you on, on everything from housing for our grand families, those grandparents that are raising right. grandchildren, uh, to food insecurity, these issues that, um, although pervasive and systemic, can often be overlooked. So just thank you uh, for your leadership. And it's great to be in virtual community with Mr. Waters and Mr. Lopez, who have been working tirelessly to provide compassionate and much needed care in the Massachusetts 7th Congressional District. Um, and Jim, to your point around um, food being medicine, the Massachusetts 7th, which I represent, is home to 15 community health centers, uh, including East Boston. And, and actually, some of our health centers do write prescriptions uh, to local farmers markets mm -hmm. uh, because food is medicine. And the Massachusetts 7th uh, has been one of the hardest hit by COVID-19 in the country with seniors and black and brown constituents in diverse working class neighborhoods from Chinatown to Chelsea, uh, to Roxbury, uh, bearing the disproportionate brunt of this pandemic. And we can attribute this disproportionate suffering to many historic policy failures, truthfully, um, and the comorbidities of structural racism. Now, one factor that is undeniable is a lack of access not only to food, but to nutritious food and to culturally responsive food, as well as an abundance of food options. And decades of nutrition and equity means that communities of color and seniors are denied access to fresh foods that would contribute to better health outcomes. And in 2020 would have helped prevent um, communities being more vulnerable to contracting COVID-19 and then when contracting it, suffering it uh, the most severe, suffering the most severe consequences. And so the cause of this access issue is really at the intersection of many policy failures. And I just wanna underscore that because we, so often we think that these, um, these social ills sort of organically happen, mm -hmm. but it has everything to do with policy failures. And in fact, a food justice advocate that I was speaking with the other day asked that I stop using the term food desert because she said, we know we come from a legacy of, of, um, of farming. We know how to grow. What we live in are food apartheid systems. Mm -hmm. And so when you're looking at everything from undercounted districts and grocery store franchises determining where to open based on census tract data, and these are also undercounted uh, communities, all, all these things work together. So the USDA has pointed to food deserts as a barrier to access, and the measure of one's proximity to food providers certainly highlights barriers in transportation. So we see that intersectionality um, of both food deserts or food apartheid systems and also transit deserts. But increasingly people are using the term food oppression um, to my earlier point to describe the host of additional barriers like high cost of living, mm -hmm. um, 
being cash poor, the cultural appropriateness of foods, and the inability of people to grow their own foods. So now more than ever, we must make significant investments. When we talk about post-COVID life, and I hope we get there soon, returning to normal, that normal was unjust, inadequate, and sufficient uh, to begin with. And so we have to make these investments in health and wellness for communities of color at the intersection of these multiple forms of oppression. Programs like uh, the medically tailored programs, uh, meals address the intersection of healthcare and food justice. And your bill, which I'm so proud to co sponsor, HR 6774, would go a long way to ensure that seniors, one of the populations hit hardest by COVID 19, can bypass each of those barriers. So, currently, for seniors living with heart disease and diabetes, the proper food is medicine. So, under the program you're proposing, people living with heart disease and diabetes who often have no option but to consume foods which exacerbate their conditions will be given the medicine of nutritious food. In the time of COVID-19 and in the name of racial justice, these medically tailored meals are urgently needed. So again, I, I thank you for your leadership and proud to be a co-sponsor and to, to work alongside well, you to make you. this a reality. Thank you, and I'm proud to work alongside of you. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, you mentioned something that uh, I hear a lot from people um, when I get when I'm back home, and they'll say, you know, I can't wait till this is all over with. We go back to normal, but normal was was not okay. Right. <laughs> and here, in the issue of food insecurity, uh, before the pandemic, close to 40 million people in this country, the richest country in the history of the world, were hungry. Didn't know where the next meal was going to come from. That can't. We can't go back to that, right? We need to create a new normal. And um, you know, and I and I. Uh, you know, I always tell people that hunger uh, and access to nutritious food, it's a political condition because we, we, we have the money, we have the resources, we know what to do, right? What we, what we lack is the political will. Um, and one of the reasons why I'm thrilled, I'm happy that, uh, that you're in Congress is that um, you're helping to generate uh, uh, more attention to some of these uh, issues that never that they are uncomfortable to talk about the people who don't want to talk about but hopefully creating the political will for us to do something meaningful and and Manny um let me if I go to you um you know you've devoted your career to increasing health care access to the vulnerable and underserved patient populations and improving outcomes for communities that are disproportionately burdened by negative uh, social uh, determinants of health can you talk about what social determinants of health what what they are so people know when we, we use that phrase a lot. I think some people don't really know what we're talking about. Could tell us what they are and why it's imperative that we incorporate social determinants in any conversations that we have about healthcare access today and generally. Sure, happy to. And uh, before I begin, just thank you again, Congressman McGovern and Congresswoman Presley uh, for your leadership, friendship. You know, when we look at the rest of the country and we see uh, the leaders that we have here in Massachusetts, and the issues that um, both of you are helping us trying to tackle. I just feel like we are so fortunate to have leaders like you who are really standing up for those that are underserved, particularly around this issue of um, you know, uh, racial disparities, uh, specifically related to health and, um, and in this case, specific to nutrition. Um, so I looked up on uh, you know, the good website of CDC to see what how they define social determinants of health, and I thought it was appropriate to share here the actual definition, which are uh, conditions in places where people live, work, and learn, and how those conditions play uh, a huge impact on health risks and outcomes. Uh, and that includes education, employment, nutrition, and housing. Um, and what we've seen time and time again that the, uh, the social, behavioral, and environmental factors are responsible for uh, chronic diseases in these neighborhoods, such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and certain cancers at a much higher rate. And what we know about in this country is that we have the most expensive healthcare system in the world. Um, and our outcomes usually are typically at the lower end of all of these other developed, more developed countries. So we're spending more and we're getting less. And studies have shown that if we increase the amount of resources or shift the resources from healthcare to social and environmental and other behavioral factors, and 
one study in particular said that shift needs to be 20% of, um, in healthcare and 60% in these other um, areas. We can improve health <coughs> outcomes. We can improve the health of our population, of the individuals. Um, so as a community health center, um, you know, and uh, I reflect back uh, over 50 years ago when um, Jack Geiger, Dr. Geiger, uh, went to South Africa and found this unique model of delivering healthcare, um, community-based, culturally sensitive um, healthcare, and brought it uh, back to Boston here in Columbia Point. Um, and um, with the help of uh, Senator, the great Senator Kennedy, uh, established community health centers. Uh, and the first script, and, and I was, you know, I had the pleasure of uh, uh, doing a talk with uh, Dr. Geiger um, at the Edward Kennedy Museum. And he talks about the very first script that he wrote at Columbia Point um, uh, Health Center was for food. Mm -hmm. Wow. The yeah. very first script. He wrote. And of course, what happened to him, he tells the story better than I can, um, that he came close to be charged with uh, medical fraud. Mm -hmm. Wow. Because writing a prescription for food was illegal. Wow. Wow. And is not reimbursable. Wow. So we knew over 50 years ago, we knew back then the importance food played in better health and, 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 and outcome. So here at the health center, um, in many health centers throughout our state, um, we recognize the importance of trying to connect people to foods, programs like David's, um, um, very important. Um, we've connected people with, of course, housing, and we've partnered with housing um, organizations like community development organizations. And we've done as much as we can to make sure that we're not just spending time providing physical health care and um, in those exam rooms that we understand that to create better health outcomes, it, um, a lot of those resources, a lot of our attention has to be, has to be outside of those exam rooms and connecting people um, to these different programs. No, and I look at thank you very much, and I appreciate you know at the at the very local level uh, at our community health centers, um, uh, in particular. I mean the issue the issue of, of of food being medicine, you know, had caught on a long time ago, right? I mean, it's some of our bigger health institutions and our insurance companies that haven't quite gotten it yet. I just got off the phone this morning uh, with N the National Institutes of Health. They, um, Dr. Francis Collins, uh, you know, we had a conversation. Uh, several months ago about the fact that NIH really doesn't have a institute on nutrition. Um, and, um, and so he has put together uh, a, a, an initiative to try to bring some of his best and brightest together to focus in on nutrition and to provide grants to local organizations and researchers to figure out how we can better promote this food as medicine uh, concept. Uh, and so I, I hope it, it produces results. But David, let me ask you, you know, my staff and I have worked very closely with you and your organization to introduce this medically tailored home delivered meals act. Um, how could federal support change the work you do? Um, and maybe explain to people like how you get supported now. Sure, sure. So one, one of the things we know is that one in three patients enters the hospital malnourished their stay is going to be three times as long and their costs are going to be three times as high as a well-nourished patient. Mm -hmm. Community Serving set out about four or five years ago to try and do research to prove an ROI or a return on investment for what it would mean to feed people. Uh, and partnering with Dr. Seth Berkowitz, uh, originally from Mass General and, and more recently from UNC, we were able to prove in two studies published in JAMA and Health Affairs that a, there's a 16% cost savings when you're providing medically tailored meals to what are called high cost, high need patients, the most expensive patients in the country. Um, if it's diet related and if you control their diet, it's, it's intuitive that uh, the cost would go down, but we've been able to prove that. And I would say whether, whether you look at feeding um, low income, sick, um, isolated individuals as a basic human right, as a moral issue, or as a business issue and a healthcare issue, 
it still makes sense. 16% cost savings for the most expensive patients is a big number. If we prevent one night in the hospital, we save enough money to feed a patient for six months. Um, so there are early adopters to this that grew out of the HIV uh, world. So there are about 12 to 15 organizations around the country. But it, as we all know, the United States is a huge country. What your bill would do, Congressman, is to widen that field. By engaging hospitals uh, 10 different, in 10 different states, 20 different hospital systems to do pilot demonstration projects around medically tailored meals to gather the data we need, then we have the opportunity to make the same resources that are available here all across Massachusetts or in Manhattan or parts of California available in the South, available in rural communities, available on reservations. All the, all the places where we know that there's significant hunger issues, nutrition issues, and expensive healthcare costs. Mm. Uh, so we're really excited to partner with you to try and bring this message forward. We've been doing this a long time, yeah, but we need, uh, we need a wider audience. And we think we have both the research and the uh, track record to prove that nationally. Yeah, well, thank you. You know, Ayana and I hear all the time from people when we, propose um, initiatives like the one we're talking about right now. Oh, you guys just want to spend more money or, you know, th you just want to do this or do that. And I always tell people, um, you know, that uh, actually uh, by investing in, um, uh, in programs like community servings, by investing in our community health centers and stuff like that, you actually, <laughs> what is the right thing to do morally, but if you're not moved by that um, or, or, or wanting to help, you know, people uh, be well, uh, you actually, uh, if you're only interested in the bottom line, I mean, investing in making sure people have good, adequate nutrition that have access to good, uh, nutritious food is actually a cost savings. Absolutely. And I could, you know, I mean, beginning at the earliest age, I mean, if I can get you on a good diet early on, I mean, the chances of you getting diabetes or uh, heart disease or high blood pressure or, or chronic diseases that you have to deal with for a lifetime, you know, uh, you know, they, we, we, we minimize that. And if when you're older, uh, again, I mean, I, I was talking to the head of a hospital that one of the number one reasons why people get admitted premature, you know, uh, prematurely back into hospitals uh, after they've had major surgeries is lack of nutrition. They go home, they don't have, you know, they don't have the strength to make a meal or whatever, and they end up back in the hospital. The hospital gets punished for that. The insurance company has to pay for that. I mean, you know, doesn't it make more sense to be able to support initiatives like community servings to prevent all of that uh, suffering and all of that excess cost? Absolutely. Ayanna, you and your staff have been an incredible, an incredible partner and advocate uh, in your work on issues like online SNAP uh, implementation and general food accessibility. Uh, have you been made aware of any challenges your constituents have faced during uh, COVID-19 and accessing healthy and nutritious food? and and what is, why is it important that we continue to bring conversations about food accessibility and affordability uh, into focus? Well, before I get to that, Jim, I do just want to say that, you know, to the point that you just made there, the reason why I think uh, something like addressing food insecurity, uh, hunger right. can be, uh, I think it's othered because people stereotype right. um, what households are food insecure. And, you know, I was elected to Congress and took an oath of office and weeks later we were in the midst of a federal government shutdown. Right. And there were lines around the corner at food banks and food pantries. And there were people that were actually stunned by this. Yeah. No one on this call is surprised by this because we know that, you know, this is a transcendent issue. Unfortunately, yes, there are some communities that um, are, are harder hit, but Unfortunately, it is so systemic, it is so pervasive that there are very few families who have not been impacted in, in, in such a way. So again, I thank you for your leadership. And um, you know, certainly I do receive, uh, my, my team and I, uh, calls about um, hunger and food insecurity within our district. And you know, for me, again, since we're here because of the failures of policy, policy is my love language. 
And that applies to my team as well, you know? Um, and so I'm lucky to have partners in the seventh district like Project Bread, the East mm -hmm. Boston Neighborhood Health Center, the Boston Medical Center, YMCA Greater Boston, and of course, community servings mm -hmm. who have worked overtime to ensure that people across my district have access to food. So since the start of the pandemic, we have been reaching out directly to seniors. Uh, my team has been doing um, check-in calls to people throughout the district, um, especially our, our seniors and to ensure that they're connected to the resources that they need in order to receive food. But the need is vast. Right. I mean, we are all struggling to meet the scale and scope of that need. And um, as we you know, enter an economic recession with nearly one in six workers in Massachusetts currently unemployed, uh, the need will just, will only further increase. So it's important to talk about food access because when children are hungry, they cannot learn, they cannot thrive in school. When people living with, dis with diabetes are hungry, their lives are quite literally at stake. And because we are living through an administration that has failed to prevent and to respond to this pandemic, I mean, truly just criminal negligence, science denial, sluggish response, all while continuing to try and cut and to restrict access to SNAP. Right. You know, so we can't afford to take our eyes off this issue. We have to continue to push for, for bold solutions. My God, it should not be a radical notion that no one in the richest country in the world should be going hungry. There's nothing radical about that. So I was grateful to see the USDA respond to our letter, which urged them to create an online SNAP program in Massachusetts. But even the program, even the program is in place, we know that additional barriers will still exist. And so I'll keep fighting alongside you to ensure that more retailers are able to participate in this program, not just Amazon and Walmart. Right. Yeah. No, and I appreciate that. And um, you're right, the need is unbelievable. I mean, I've, uh, you know, and I appreciate, uh, you know, all the, the groups that you mentioned. I also appreciate the, the food banks, the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts, the Worcester Food Bank, the Greater Boston Food Bank, they've been incredible as well. I was in Athol, uh, which is in my district, uh, a couple of weeks ago for a grab and go um, program where the, the, the Food Bank of Western Mass helps uh, uh, organize it and basically, um, you know, providing boxes of fresh, sure. uh, nutritious food to people in need. The, the line of cars that lined up was as far as the eye could see. Um, and a lot of them were senior citizens. Um, uh, and so the need is there. And, uh, you know, and, and, and I, I, I sometimes get frustrated because when, you know, when we talk about food insecurity and hunger, you know, the people sometimes talk about them, you know, in stereotypical ways. Yeah. The bottom line is people who are hungry and who are food insecure are not just people who are homeless or jobless. They're people who have jobs. They're kids in school. My two sisters teach in the Worcester Public School uh, uh, Department. I mean, kids who come to their schools, you know, oh, you know on Mondays have eaten all weekend. Um, and if you've ever seen a child who is hungry, it breaks your heart. And it is totally unacceptable because, again, we're in the United States. I mean, we have we I mean, if you can if you can afford to, you know, a tax break for billionaires or if you can afford to build another nuclear missile. I mean, God almighty, why can't we why can't we use those monies to to really provide uh, a sense of national security by uh, by, uh, by 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 making sure that everybody in this country uh, you know, has, has enough to eat. So, uh, I mean, it's, 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 um, you know, I mean, it is, it is hunger impacts a huge number of people again, 40 million before the pandemic, Manny, uh, the East Boston neighborhood health center handles over 300,000 patient visits per year, um, which is more than any other ambulatory care center in new England. Um, uh, can you talk about the important role community health centers play in, in health equity and how would medically tailored meals benefit patients like those who visit your health center? Yeah, um, I would say we have two great examples of how um, we've helped uh, you know, close that gap. And, and one of them is a partnership with community servings. Um, the health centers, 18 health centers came together a couple of years ago to uh, create our own accountable care organization with the partnership with uh, the state's um, Medicaid program, Mass Health, um, we're looking to, um, to change what I just described, you know, the cost and quality equation. So improve the quality of care, and of course, bring down that cost of care. 
uh, knowing how much we spend um, in our state and across the country. Uh, the, uh, the company is called C3 Community Care Cooperative. Uh, we've seen tremendous amount of success, but I think, again, to David's uh, quote, uh, the success has come by uh, not necessarily what's happening in the exam room. Again, it's what's happening outside of that exam room and partnering with um, community servings to provide um, medically tailored meals. Uh, and we've seen significant savings and we've seen improved in health outcomes. Um, the second example is our PACE program, um, yes. what's also known as Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. It was a program that we brought to Massachusetts. It was developed in San Francisco, uh, originally called Onlock. Um, and what they were able to demonstrate in this program is that it's a fully, and I'll get technical a little bit, help a fully capitated program, meaning that uh, we are paid on a per member basis, um, not on a fee for service basis. So we're the insurance company and we're the provider of healthcare, most of the healthcare. And, these, and this program is designed for frail elderly individuals, individuals who normally you would um, would have to be in nursing homes. And the goal of the program is to keep them living in the community uh, and living independent for as long as possible. Um, within that program, we identified some of those social determinants uh, that I explained to you, particularly around housing and nutrition, as being a key factor of keeping these individuals um, active and healthy. Um, so today, uh, we provide a similar service to David's organization, uh, except we we do that in-house, so we have our own kitchen. We provide medically tailored meals. Um, last year, we provided over 140,000 uh, meals uh, to these wow. individuals. And again, it really does um, it help them, keeping them uh, living at home with a family member or even in many cases alone. Um, and outside of institutions, we brought down uh, the, the hospitalization, the emergency room utilization, all of the key indicators that you would want to see um, have really come down. And, and if you speak to some of them, and I know Congresswoman uh, Presley uh, in her last visit to East Boston uh, heard from one of the um, participants of the program, um, they're living active and full lives because we're helping close some of those gaps, particularly in the area of nutrition and food. Gentlemen, I'm so sorry. I have to go because um, my esteemed colleague is already in the Capitol and I have to get there and okay. votes have been called and my group is going to be up. Okay. So um, but we, we, we all, we all vote uh, alpha in groups now because of the, yes. the COVID-19 crisis. So uh, thank, but you. Diana, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I just want to say, Jim McGovern, you're my Congressman. Oh. Yes. <laughs> you know, I claim you, I claim you. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. Good, I appreciate Manny, it. appreciate you all so very much. Take care. Thank you, thank you uh, Congresswoman. Thank you, Congresswoman. Well, and, before, and thank you, Ayanna. Go vote. And then, uh, but today, um, uh, you know, I, th let me, I, you know, since we, they, they just called the vote, we're going to have to go. Um, but I, I, I want to give you both an opportunity to kind of say whatever you want to say uh, by way of, by way of closing here, let me let me say I, I, I I'm trying to remember David. What, I, I we we did a ho a home visit a, a meal delivery in Worcester. I, what was the milestone? That was the what number meal was? I can't remember. Was it the hundred thousand meal or I can't remember. I think what it, was it was the hundred thousand meal in Worcester. Right, and I remember, and I remember it because one, for two reasons. Uh, one, uh, the wonderful uh, uh, elderly woman who we delivered the meal to one was was couldn't say enough nice things about the program and the quality of the food and and just how it has made her feel better I mean just effusive praise right um, and then she looked at me and she's well I haven't seen you in a long time boy you've gotten old um, but uh, notwithstanding that uh, I, I that was one of the one of the most enjoyable days uh, I've had in a long time because it's this is real right this is real this is real help and real support you know and um you know and the bottom line is people are even a lot of working people who are struggling you know we, we talk a lot about snap you know the, the snap benefit is so underfunded i mean i you know it is the average snap benefit is about a dollar 40 per person per meal you can't even buy a cup i bought a cup of coffee on the way to work this morning walking into the capitol um and i think my coffee was like three dollars um i mean but living on a SNAP budget is, you, people can't do it. Uh, and then 
the issue of accessibility, depending on where you live, can you have access to good nutritious food that is affordable? I mean, we, we just need to do this better. Um, and, um, and I'm in awe of, uh, of, of all the work that both of you do. But let me, David and then Manny, I'll give you the, the last word here to say whatever you, you think you want everybody to, to come away with. So David, we we'll begin with sure. you. Sure, sure. Thank you very much. And thank you for hosting us today. Um, you know, I, I keep thinking about the, the COVID crisis and, and how unbelievably scary it is. But even those of us who have uh, been able to keep our jobs and have stable housing and maybe two cars in the garage, we're still having trouble at the worst times of the lockdown in getting food. Right. Um, you know, and, and that's a, you know, a first world problem when it's me trying to get food. But when you're sick, uh, and you're isolated, and you've got children at home, and you're worried about being evicted, um, and you're going through cancer treatments, how unbelievably scary that is. I'm hoping my optimism says that uh, there is a greater realization about access to food because of the COVID pandemic, but also um, a strong connection between food and health. Because right. if you can't eat, you can't stay healthy. If you can't get food, you can't eat. Um, it makes sense. Not, I would say we're not asking healthcare to feed the, or the federal government to feed the whole world or feed the whole country. But where there's a smart healthcare argument to do it, where we're gonna save costs, we're gonna improve outcomes, then it's just logical if it's the cheaper option that we should be doing it. Um, and what your bill does is allow us to prove that. Uh, there's great research already, but uh, more is better. And if we can get more hospitals and health centers on board and uh, more uh, leaders in government to endorse this, uh, it would be a beautiful thing. And we're grateful for your help. Thank you. Manny? Yeah, and, I would, and I'm gonna reflect on the current situation that we're in as well in terms of the COVID crisis. And, and looking uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, driving through uh, the city of Chelsea, which many have heard um, had the highest number of cases in the state and on a per capita basis at one point was higher than um, New York City and um, in terms of the number of cases there. And at driving through there, um, there was a Chelsea collaborative who was doing food distribution. Um, and as I was driving through, I counted seven city blocks of people lined up, seven, seven city blocks. And Congressman, to your point, in the richest country in the world, um, in a time when we have resources to do a whole bunch of other things, uh, to, to not be able to solve this really simple problem of putting nutritionist, nutrition, nutritional meals on the table for, for individuals and families. I think is a crime, right. and I, and, but I'm hopeful that with leaders like you, fighters like you and fighters like Congresswoman uh, Presley, uh, at least we're bringing the conversations back up again and we're having these conversations. So I'm hopeful and the shifting of those dollars. And, uh, and I say this as a healthcare provider, you know, take what you're giving to us and give it to organizations like David's. <laughs> Allow us to, uh, instead of writing those uh, uh, pharmaceutical prescriptions, allow us to write those scripts for the things that we know will improve someone's health um, and overall health outcomes. Uh, and so thank you for your leadership in this area. I look forward to uh, supporting uh, your bill. And as, if there's anything that we could do uh, to help continue this, allow, continue to allow this to move forward, please let us know. Well, thank you. Uh, and look, I, I appreciate uh, uh, both of you and I appreciate uh, Congresswoman Presley uh, for being on this conversation. You know, the, these issues are, are all related. Um, I mean, racial justice, food access, medically tailored meals, um, you know, they're all, they're all related. Uh, and, um, and, we need, and we need to move these issues to the forefront now. You know, uh, again, this pandemic, as horrible as it has been, you know, has, and, and, and it has pointed out the inequities and the injustices that exist in our country, um, you know, and the, and, the, and the disparities in terms of access to good food. Um, I mean, this, is, this has to be an opportunity 
to not go back to normal, but to create a, a new normal. Um, and many, I think you invoked Ted Kennedy's name uh, in the, the beginning. I, you know, I was fortunate enough to get elected and be able to serve with him. I mean, one of my heroes. I mean, who, you know, uh, had this incredible heart and uh, and had and had a, a, a special commitment uh, to the most vulnerable in this country and uh, was a champion on on these issues. And you know, I my first job as a paid intern in Washington when I was in college was for another great uh, person, George McGovern, no relation, uh, but I worked for him for many years, the Senator from South Dakota, um, but who, who hunger was one of his primary uh, uh, concerns and, and focuses as a United States Senator, uh, global and, uh, and domestic. I mean, he worked in a bipartisan way to strengthen some of our, our social safety nets, uh, including SNAP and school meals and you know, and he headed up the special select committee on, on nutrition and set dietary goals for the country. And, you know, it was, it was, was incredible. Um, you know, I, I miss the leadership of, of those two great individuals, but what gives me hope um, is the leadership uh, of, uh, of David and you and, and Manny and others. I have great community health centers in my, my district as well. People who are, who, who are doing it, and not just talking about it, but doing it. And, um, and so um, I'm grateful for this conversation and, uh, and look forward to working with you, not only my legislation, but to figure out all the next steps that we need to take. Uh, uh, and, um, and we need to think big and we need to think boldly. Um, and we need to understand that everybody in this country is important, that nobody is invisible uh, and that, um, and that we have, we can do it. It's a matter of priorities. Um, I always tell people budgets are moral documents. They tell you what you value. Uh, and I want a budget that values people more than nuclear weapons, uh, that values people more than tax breaks for billionaires, uh, that values people more than, you know, funding some special interest group that uh, is only interested in making profits for a, a very few. So I thank you all very much and uh, please be safe. And we will continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Congressman. Thank you, Thank Congressman. you, Manny. Thank you, David. Take care.